you go on the racks, you'll see a lot of those yellow Pan Am Games volunteers jackets. Because <laughs> I don't think people are really remembering their times particularly fondly working out there in Oshawa. Welcome back. This is uh, week two, season 2.5 of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. Uh, if you like what you've heard so far, uh, hit like, uh, hit subscribe, leave a comment. If you dislike what you heard, uh, leave a comment. We don't care. Leave a dislike. We don't care. We're just here trying to feed the algorithm. Um, so welcome back one more. And we do this every week. Uh, this is my favorite 40 ish minutes of the week. And I hope it is yours too. I don't do this by myself. I do this with the best panel in the business. It's still the best, even when we have to, um, bring in a replacement. When we talk about wins above replacement, like Corey Urban's not a replacement level player, but we'll get to him in a second. Uh, Megan McPeak in Washington, D.C., play-by-play voice of the Washington Mystic, play-by-play voice of the Capital City Go-Go. How are we doing? I'm doing well. Hello, good people. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, joining me in Toronto, and this is uh, one of my favorite people to work with, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, play-by-play voice of like all types of boxing broadcasts that you've heard, play-by-play voice of uh, a lot of track and field, uh, boxing expert, Cleveland Browns fan, and a really sharp sports guy uh, in Toronto, Ontario. Corey Urban, what's up? Not too much, man. Hey, all the best to uh, Mr. Zyron and his family out there. Uh, I've been reading the Bring It In playbook so that I can be the best <laughs> scout team Dave Zyron I can be. And I started with an Ali painting behind me. I hear that's the first step. So I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> well no, done. Listen, well done. You're not, but you're not scout team Zyron and you're not replacement player, right? You're, this, <laughs> is, this, is, this, is more like, uh, this is more like trading a starter for a starter. <laughs> or uh, well, here we go. You're a Cleveland Browns guy. This is like Nick Chubb has to go someplace, and then Kareem Hunt comes in. Like there's no drop off. It's just Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. What are you gonna do? It's not like you're or even the guy from the fishing boat, the Mahi Mahi man. Like remember right. how good he was, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't matter who you plug in, they roll. <laughs> so Corey Urban is a big Browns fan, guys. This is why I told that. Uh, and so this week we listen. We have a lot on the docket. We have um, we're talking. Uh, one of Corey's favorite subjects, which is anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to clarify that. Hold on. <laughs> not, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I am not an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> I, I didn't like say you were. Okay, there you go. I said it's one of your favorite topics. Um, we are talking getting paid to volunteer and the predictable problems uh, that leads to. And we're also talking uh, crossover between boxing and mixed martial arts. So let's start there. Uh, last week, June 10th, uh, three division, three division world boxing champion, Clarissa Shield, two time Olympic boxing gold medalist, Clarissa Shields, made her mixed martial arts debut in a professional fighters league uh, card. She spent two rounds kind of getting taken down and struggling and wriggling out of some really precarious positions before she got to her feet against Brittany Elkins, uh, landed a few huge punches, dropped Brittany Elkins, got her on the ground and didn't let her up, won by knockout. Um, but it was, listen, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was close. Court Urban, uh, you're up first since you're our boxing, like people know me as a boxing guy, but Corey is the boxing guy. Uh, why is this even happening? Like, why is Clarissa Shields crossing over from boxing to mixed martial arts? Well, I think there's two things going on. I think number one, part of it is financial, but that's more to do with the principle of it for Clarissa Shields, because she can make a good wage fighting in a boxing ring. And she does, you know, she would tell you that she can probably field you know, about 300,000 plus from any network out there. The problem is Clarissa Shields, you mentioned her accomplishments, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. She's been undisputed in two weight classes. Male fighters of similar achievements are making millions and millions of dollars. Mm. And Clarissa has been trying to get that same level of appreciation in boxing. And I think that's the real crux of this issue is the, the issue of appreciation. The boxing industry, I find, is a large segment of the boxing media, uh, an even louder segment of boxing's fan base, and I think tacitly people in charge in boxing who are working to kind of discredit Clarissa and prove mm -hmm. that she's not a box office draw or isn't as important or as accomplished as she is. And now you have MMA, and in particularly uh, PFL and ESPN, who are saying, no, no, you're the star. 
car. We're going to build something around you. We're going to put you in national commercials. We're going to orchestrate this entire card around you. And that's a level of appreciation that, frankly, Clarissa hasn't felt since turning professional. Yeah, it's it's strange because when you see a man that boxes and, done, and does mixed martial arts, it's usually a sign that that man isn't elite at either one of them. Like... Mm -hmm. uh, like your man Terry Martin from back in the day, like he would get knocked out in boxing, uh, go some, go to some other state, get a license, get knocked out in mixed martial arts. When you see a woman do it, it's usually because they're very good at both. It's like it's Clarissa Shields, Holly Holm, and like not very many other people. Like they're at the top of the of the sport, um, both sports. But yeah, to your point, there should be more money in being one as good as Clarissa Shields is just from a skills standpoint, but also, yes, your resume, because when you grow up in the United States and you box, what do they tell you about how to get paid? Well, if you go to the Olympics and win a medal, that's where you will get, that's when you will get paid. Like, what do you think keeps all these amateur boxers boxing? Like, yes, there's a love of the sport and blah, 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 but they also know that turning pro as a civilian uh, and pr turning pro as an Olympian is two different pay scales. And then turning pro as an Olympic medalist is an even higher pay scale. So that's why they stick around. Clarissa Shields has done it twice, but she's still, you know, looking for some pay, pay, pay equity and she's not getting it. Megan McPeak, how sustainable is it for Clarissa Shields to play two pro sports, contact sports, collision sports, like at the same time? Well, I am not the boxing or MMA expert like Corey is or like you are, Morgan. But so I'm going to preface it by saying that. And then this is just my thought process and clearly an assumption on my part because I'm not a boxer and I'm not an MMA fighter. But I would assume if you're doing two combat sports at the same time where blows to the head are consistently accepted, and welcomed and encouraged because you want to get that knockout punch, you want to land that knockout knee kick, you're putting yourself in a position where injuries and serious injuries could come faster than you may get them if you were just doing one of those sports at one time. So I, I, I respect what she is doing because it is not easy to do one of those sports, let alone doing both of them at the same time because you're training for two different sports mm -hmm. at the same time and both are very technical when it comes to doing them properly and being uh, being the best at both sports. So trying to remember which one you're working on at the same time, mm -hmm. I respect her for that and respect her for just simply putting her body on the line in both of these sports. So just my uh, amateur assumption, I feel it puts herself at a greater risk for injuries sooner than later. But that being said, if she's training properly and getting the technical aspect of it, she's also learning how to protect herself from those big blows so that she can fight long-term and avoid, or at least attempt to avoid those serious injuries sooner than later. But at the end of the day, respect to her because I know for sure I'm not getting in the ring with her in either <laughs> sport. Corey Urban, like, I know you're a big boxing fan. I know you're not much of a mixed martial arts fan. Um, how much are you concerned that like, MMA becomes Clarissa Shields' job as opposed to her sideline. I mean, I think it's very possible. I mean, you have to remember that Clarissa's last boxing match, she went out on her own and put on an independent pay-per-view where she mm -hmm. didn't know if she would even make $1 based on what the income from that fight would be. And she did that so that she could give a platform to other women's fighters. You know, it was a very, it was an amazing gesture for mm -hmm. her to even do that. But I think it's possible if MMA keeps throwing money at her and appreciation at her, that this keeps happening. Because I, I think we have to ask questions as to why four of the most significant women's boxers of the last 10 to 15 years have been moonlighting in MMA or have been moonlighting in MMA at different points. So two of the three best pound for pound women's boxers right now, Clarissa Shields and Amanda Serrano, do mm -hmm. both. Heather Hardy, who at one point, was probably the best ticket seller of any women's boxer in the United States and up there globally, had to go to Bellator and, and fought in MMA. Holly Holm, of course, kind of the, you know, the trailblazer of all of this. Mm -hmm. She had to do that as well. She was a multi-weight champion, went over to MMA and just did that full time. You talk about sustainability. I think we have to ask questions about what the sustainability of being a women's boxer in the United States is and why that is 
when they can still put them on main events and in the same places where men's boxers are fighting, but they can't pay them properly, th that's the sustainability <laughs> question that I think needs to be posed. There's another fight going on in uh, Tokyo among, among, among several fights to get the, these Olympic Games staged. So now, the last I read, 13% of Japan's population has the first dose of the vaccine. Um, which again is an even slower rollout than we experienced here in Canada. And we got we had a slow start, fast finish. Um, I think the state of emergency is still on. And the last we heard about volunteers, 110,000 volunteers, roughly, uh, 10,000 of them said, "We quit. We're not going to volunteer. We can't do this for no money." Um, story from the Financial Times earlier on the weekend points out that uh, the Olympic organizers, local organizing committee now is advertising like these jobs that were vacated by uh, volunteers are now being posted and they're offering $15 an hour, 15 US dollars an hour uh, to people to come fill these jobs. At which point all the volunteers are saying, well, where's my $15 an hour? Like, how is she getting paid? How is he getting paid $15 an hour to do the same thing that I'm doing for free, not to mention like the story lays out some of these jobs and some of the responsibilities. Like they're they're telling people to volunteer, but you got to work nine hour shifts, right? You're volunteering to drive people around. You're volunteering to interpret. You're working these shifts that keep you on the job after the last train has gone for no money. And so now here comes somebody else making $15 an hour, do the same thing that you're doing for free. Uh, Megan McPeak, <laughs> how well do you think this is going to go over? It's a no for me. <laughs> it's not gonna I mean it it wasn't going over well when we saw 10,000 volunteers decide like I'm good I don't need to do this and now you're asking the other 100,000 volunteers who stayed on board to accept the fact that 10,000 more people are going to join and get paid to your point right. Morgan why are they getting paid and I'm not so yes. if you were able to find this money to pay the missing 10,000 volunteers that had turned around and left, then you should be able to find a way to pay all 110,000 people because to your point, you're asking these people to volunteer hours at a time to put themselves in a position where we are still in a global pandemic, the virus is still moving around the world and still mutating. Mm -hmm. And even if people are vaccinated or not, because that is a personal decision, you still put yourself at risk for catching the virus because we still don't know everything about this virus. So to ask them to do this and not get any compensation, I think is unfair and it's terrible. You're asking people to work during a global pandemic and there's nothing to protect them. They don't, they're not getting anything health wise. You're not giving them any health care to make sure <laughs> that if they, if they were to unfortunately catch the virus while working one of these shifts, what are you going to do to help them? Are you going to give them something in return because they can no longer now do their job that was unpaid anyway? So I feel that if you can find the money for 10,000, you should be able to find money and should have found money for the 100,000 because this is not a typical Olympic Games. It's the Olympics in a pandemic. We need to figure out a way to encourage people to still put their lives and their health on the line to make sure these games go on. Well, yeah, you're asking people to work, not just work, but work these jobs that require like a lot of close contact with other people. Yes. And I thought the whole point was to try to keep people apart, to try to keep this disease from spreading if it's going to spread, especially if you're in a country where not a lot of people are vaccinated. So it'll spread more quickly if it gets there. But you're telling me, I got to drive this car. I got to drive these big wig, big wigs from one venue to another. These dudes might be sick. I don't know them. I haven't met them. Um, two, if you're offering to pay the 10,000 volunteers, what you're also doing is telling the other 110,000 the other 100,000 volunteers to quit because if you quit, they will offer you money to lure you back. So if I was one of the 110,000, I would be submitting my resignation right now. You can't fire me. I quit. I'm not even really quitting because it's not a real job because you don't pay me. So I'll just stay home. I'll watch. And if you want me back, run me my money. Corey Erdman, uh, if you're an Olympic volunteer in Japan, what are you doing right about now? 
I'm quitting, but I, I'm also just not working. I'm not going to do any of that because the thing is, this isn't just about the volunteers. Let's remember that just a couple of months ago, there was a report from the uh, Building and Woodworkers International about mm. the labor conditions for the construction workers who were working on the eight venues that had to be constructed for these Olympics. And they are alleging horrible label, labor violations and actually have attributed two deaths and not just on the job, but people taking their own lives because of those working conditions. And, you know, Japan is notoriously poor when it comes to regulations, when it comes to pay or hours. So even if you are getting those $15 an hour, I don't know that your working conditions are going to be particularly good. It's great that you're getting some wage and maybe, you know, you can negotiate that. But I think that there is a much larger problem. And in fact, in that same report, they believe that by 2025, there's going to be a shortage of almost 900,000 construction workers in Japan. So that's how bad the situation is. It isn't just volunteers. It's even paid laborers uh, are just in a terrible position if you're working in Japan right now. Meanwhile, uh, Euro, what's, is it Euro 2020? Are they, are they still calling it 2020 or 2021? Yes, yes. So Euro, still 2020. Euro, Euro 2020 had like a really tense moment. Um, Saturday morning, uh, Denmark and Finland were playing and a Danish player named, let me get his name right, Christian Eriksen collapses on the field, uh, goes into cardiac arrest. So afterward, the doctor's like, yeah, his heart stopped beating. Uh, we jolted him with a defibrillator and that's how we brought him back. And so predictably, um, the talk starts rippling around the internet, speculating as to the cause of this person's collapse because he couldn't have just collapsed the way you sometimes you see athletes do. Um, and the one that's getting the most traction is, Corey, I want you to guess which theory is getting the most traction. Uh, is it that the vaccine that caused him to collapse on the field? Apparently, not just the vaccine or a vaccine, the anti-vaxxers have pinpointed the Pfizer vaccine as the cause of uh, Christian Erickson's cardiac arrest. Now, Christian Erickson is recovering in hospital. He wants to know what happened. Um, Turns out he has never had COVID-19, and it turns out he has never been vaccinated. But Megan McPeak, did that stop the misinformation from rippling around the internet? Of course not. <laughs> Even if he had, it wouldn't have stopped. Like, the fact that the internet, the interwebs, the Twitterverse, all just decided, well, he had COVID-19 and he got the Pfizer vaccine without a ounce or a minuscule or a grass piece Played, yeah. of evidence like where is the evidence that any of this happened we are now turning a horrific and scary terrifying event not only for christian erickson for his teammates but his family on live national television into an anti-vaccine COVID conspiracy. The man could have lost his life playing for his country and conspiracy theorists want to make this about the vaccine and the virus. Are you kidding me right now? How about let's have some respect for the man and his family and his country and his club teammates for the fact that they could have just witnessed their teammate and family member die in a soccer match. Let's have some respect for the man. And without evidence, we're just going to assume, yep, he got vaccinated, that's why. Yeah, he had COVID-19, that's why. Respect to his medical team and his uh, club team with, I believe it's Inter Milan, coming out and saying he never had COVID-19 and he never had the vaccine. And also credit to him for allowing them to do that because obviously that's, a medic that's medical privacy. Yes. He did. He could have easily just left this alone and said, I'm not going to tell people. He made the decision personally to say, no, 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 no. Put my medical information out there because I'm not allowing conspiracy theorists to even touch this. And even with that information, they're still running with the conspiracy that this man had COVID and he had the vaccine. How about we allow the medical people to actually do their job, test him and figure out what caused him to collapse? Because had that not happened, who knows what could have been missed? It's the similar situation to me with LaMarcus Aldridge. He mm -hmm. made the gut-wrenching decision to retire because of a heart issue. Had this not happened, who knows how long Erickson could have gone playing, 
playing with just family members, having yep. a good time, enjoying his life. And this gone unnoticed and undetected. Thankfully, in a weird turn of events, they can figure out what is going on with his body because clearly something was going on. Also keep in mind, these football players have been playing almost every other day or every couple of days since January. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it's, as we were saying offline, it's more, it's more amazing that more people aren't just passing out from sheer exhaustion in the middle of these games. But Hey, listen, don't ever let anyone tell you that Megan McPeak does not dream big, that Megan McPeak is not ambitious, that Megan McPeak is not afraid don't let anyone tell you that Megan McPeak is afraid to set goals that are nearly impossible because right here on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell, Megan McPeak addressing anti-vaxxers said, have some respect. <laughs> Megan McPeak, listen, most of us would give up, but Megan McPeak still believes somehow, some way we can wring some respect Listen, for human beings out of the anti-vaccine if, community. You're a bigger person than I am, Megan. If the Finnish fans... And the Danish fans can come together in that moment and cheer for Ericsson chanting his name back and forth mm -hmm. and support the fans in that horrific moment. Then I can have a grass blade of a hope that <laughs> anti-vaxxers might be able to have some respect for this man and his family. I know it's a crazy thought to have, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I guess I still have some hope in humanity in 2021. Or <laughs> See, that's why I can bring you on the show, Megan, because usually I'm grumpy and you're the one that like actually believes in people still. Uh, Corey Erdman, how much belief do you have uh, in the people pushing this particular conspiracy theory? Uh, if, if they were capable of having their minds changed, I think that after almost two years of this, I think that would have happened already. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we actually went through this, I mean, you and I on Twitter a little bit when Marvin Hagler passed away and yes. there were many in the anti-vaxxer community and the cross-pollinated anti-vaxxer and boxing community yes. who immediately pushed the idea that he had died due to the vaccine. And which, you know, obviously it had to be disproven and his grieving widow had to come out. And, and Corey, real quick, I'm going to let you continue. But even like vaccine agnostic boxing fans are also boxing fans as a group are so prone to conspiracy theories because they love conspiracy theories to explain like decisions that don't make sense. So this like the Hagler death and Tommy Hearns tweeting what he tweeted. This was such fertile ground for that for for this particular conspiracy theory because again boxing fans we love conspiracy theories we love to talk about fixed fights with no evidence uh here it came go ahead Corey. well it, it's just they're they're not going to follow this story to its actual end you know the, no. even the information now where you know they've literally told you that he did not have covid and didn't take the vaccine those people aren't going to be reading those news sources to even find that out. And they don't want that information, even if it were placed in front of them. So it, it doesn't, no, they're not going to have well, their minds changed at all. Of course, they're going to tell you he didn't have uh, the vaccine, Corey. That's what they want you to think. That's what they yeah. want you to know. Yes, right. That's right. It's, you guys aren't thinking deep enough. See, this is the problem. You guys just aren't smart enough. You're just taking the first answer that's given to you. You're not smart like I am. I see the conspiracy, right? <laughs> We talk about this all the time when we would talk boxing and these conspiracy theorists and how like conspiracy theory people, conspiracies are sexy because they make you feel like you're smarter than everyone else. Like the average person is just taking the story that's given to them, but you're so smart. You go deeper and you find the real answer. Like you see this everywhere. Like even have you seen the, the Pedialyte sport commercial, like for the red Pedialyte? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and first of all, like, if you're into sports, if you played sports, you know that, like, athletes have just been drinking regular Pedialyte for a long time, the same stuff they give to babies. Like, yo, I'm dehydrated. I just finished my weigh-in. Let me rehydrate. So now they've made it red, <laughs> right? <laughs> Had some red food coloring, and now they're marketing, like, Gatorade, but the person, like, the voiceover is, like, everyone else drinks what they're told to drink, but you can drink Pedialyte. Like, what is this? <laughs> if not a commercial telling me to drink Pedialyte. Like, I'm not smarter because I'm drinking Pedialyte instead of Gatorade. I'm probably dumber because it probably costs more. And Wait, like, is, is, is Pedialyte pivoting to become like the soylent of, of athletes? Is that, what, are they, what are they going for? I don't know what it's like in Canada, but P to buy Pedialyte in the U.S., it's typically behind the uh, like customer service counter. 
oh, and it's locked. Yes. So you you have to go through people to get the PDO. <laughs> well, see, but they, that just, makes more sense, right? Right. Get it. <laughs> right. So leave 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 the right. So leave the Gatorade for like all the all the all the um lemmings and the sheep who are satisfied with the easy answers. You'll go the extra mile, right? But let me uh, like before we leave this topic, like. The conspiracy theorists, and we talked about this before, Corey, on, on previous shows we've done, the conspiracy theorists pretend they're smarter than the rest of us. They're not smarter than the rest of us. Like all this research you say you're doing on COVID-19 and on the vaccines, you're not researching, like you're, you're Googling, which is completely different. Google is easy. Google also kind of knows how you think because you Google stuff all the time. So Google's just going to tell you what it thinks you want to hear. You're not researching like you're not lining up people in a laboratory you're not um you don't have the the samples under a microscope and saying oh Corey, this uh this nucleotide looks problematic like you're not doing that right you're just googling you find an answer you like you go with it and that's it uh, but the bottom line is christian erickson did not have covid 19 and he did not have the vaccine so whatever it is that made his hot heart stop beating one we're glad they were they're able to restart it and two it wasn't the vaccine, so conspiracy theorists uh, live with that. Um, while meantime, we will live with this because it is time for my favorite part of my favorite part of the week, in and out I'm going to tee him up, knock him down real quick. Corey Urban, we're going to start with you. So um, your man Jarvis Landry, Cleveland, Cleveland Browns possession receiver, uh, had a big charity slow pitch tournament. Uh, your other man, uh, Baker Mayfield, showed up and was hitting bombs mm -hmm. so he was over here looking like vlad jr and obj showed up odell beckham jr and uh had some pop-ups and he had he had some swings and misses on batting practice fastballs in a softball softball slow pitch home run derby Corey erdman are you in or out on odell beckham jr's right to suck at something in this case slow pitch Listen, we have seen Odell Beckham hit a home run in Yankee Stadium. We've seen him hit one at Tropicana Field. I think he just might be more of a, of a hardball guy. Plus, we've also seen Odell Beckham throw a softball overhand 90 miles per hour from the hardball uh, pitching map. So <laughs> Odell Beckham can hit bombs. I think it was just a bad day for OBJ. And as someone who grew up playing hardball, sometimes I suck at slow pitch too. I'm going to give him a pass. <laughs> okay, perfect. Megan, you peek you in or out. I'm in on it. I mean, at the end of the day, that ball comes in so slow that you're so used to things happening a million miles an hour when you're playing football and you're, you know, running after guys and you're running away from guys. I mean, it's okay if he's bad at something. He doesn't need to be perfect at everything. <laughs> he's not me. <laughs> exactly. I'm out on Odell Beckham Jr.'s right to suck at slow pitch softball because slow pitch softball is the thing that you play um, like when you can't really play anything else. And it's the one thing like almost everyone can play, which is why you have a charity slow pitch game and not a charity basketball game, not a charity fast pitch game, um, not a charity boxing match. Although this is what they're trying to push on us these days. Odell Beckham Jr. Like if you can do all these other things, you can hit a softball tossed underhand straight down the middle. Um, topic two, Bronny James, apparently had, uh, uh, they had to clean up uh, some debris from his meniscus mid-season. So he gets a surgery. He comes back. He starts playing again. So he his season actually started this past week. Uh, he goes to play out in California. Of course, LeBron James shows up. And then he brings along Drake, who has been buddies with LeBron for a long time. Drake sits in the front row of this high school basketball game. I hope that he's vaccinated, um, fully vaccinated, two shots, because he's there with no mask, just berating the referee, Megan McPeak, are you in or out on obnoxious Uncle Drake talking trash to the referee at Bronny James's game? Listen, okay. I'm in on him, you know, riding for riding for his pseudo nephew. I am <laughs> out on the fact that he was that close without a mask on in a <laughs> pandemic. Uh, if you're going to berate him, you don't need to get like right up in his ear, right over the shoulder behind him. You don't like we come on social distance at least a little bit give us give us the appearance of your you socially distance uh but i mean at the end of the day uh probably lebron would rather him than himself so i think it was the right move for drake to do it and not lebron <laughs> <laughs> perfect yeah he's a uh, um he can berate the rest vicariously through his buddy Corey urban exactly. you're out 
I am in because you will not catch me on a, on a national Canadian media platform saying bad things about Drake. But on a, on, a, on a more serious level, I like the fact that high school games have become these social events because it can only lend power to these athletes coming out of high school as they make that next decision. So having Drake and J.R. Smith and all the people who are there watching that game, high school games are cool. And these kids are going to come out of school with a lot more leverage than they had before. Absolutely. I'm still out on it because it's Bronny James. Uh, and again, I'm not Mr. Uh, the son is automatically as good as the dad, but let's face it. He was born at the deep end of the gene pool. He has had, he has plenty of practice chances to practice basketball. This team they were on, I don't know if they were as stacked as they were last year, but they were essentially recruiting players. Like from all of, remember they had a guy from Korea. He was seven <laughs> feet tall on this high school team. Like they have all the advantages. They don't need some celebrity uncle, uh, working the refs as well like these things will work themselves out and because and in the end too it is also high school basketball like uh if Bronny james is serious about basketball he will have bigger games in the future than you know a high school league game mid-season like drake cool out man seriously uh last one jock peterson last week in chicago when they were playing uh san diego he hit a home run and he trolled Fernando Tatis Jr. You watch Fernando Tatis home runs, Fernando Tatis Jr. home runs. When he gets to third base, he does a little uh, stutter step, touches the base, goes on home. So Jock Peterson does it against uh, San Diego. Cool, we get it because Tatis is there. Um, and then he does it against the Cardinals. Um, I'm not sure that's as cool. Megan McPeak, are you in or out on Jock Peterson continuing to do this stutter step home run trot that Fernando Tatis Jr. actually brought to the league. I'm in on it, especially if he had done it before playing San Diego, not necessarily trolling, but in the sense of like, he just liked it. So he's like, you know what? Tatis is bringing a little swag to the game. Let me just add more to it as well, too. I don't think it was trolling. But at the end of the day, I'm also from the era that I preferred 90s basketball, um, where you know, you troll everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. I mean, imitation is the flatter, flattering. You know what I'm trying to say. Sincere form of flattery, yes, exactly. Thank yes. You. See, that's why we're a team. We finish each other's sentences. <laughs> I, I mean, baseball is so boring that I, I need as much excitement and trolling as possible. So I'll take it. Okay, that's a spicy take, uh, Corey Erdman. You in or out on ah. on Peterson continuing to do this? I'm in as well, and, and he has said so. He has told Cubs reporters that this was an homage to Jock Pe or to uh, to Fernando Tatis. He's doing it because he thinks he's cool, and he, he's one of his favorite players to watch. And I think that's that's great because I think that baseball, since that magical summer of McGuire versus Sosa, has <laughs> lagged behind in terms of marketing individual stars. And now they are doing that. You know, Tatis is on the cover of video games doing the bat flip. When you watch MLB TV. You see commercials about uh, players having fun again. And if this just adds to that, that's great because I think that baseball had fallen into this pattern of just being this regionalized sport where mm -hmm. I only watch the Tigers. And, and if I'm growing <laughs> up, I don't, I don't care about these other individual stars. Whereas like in basketball, you'll watch a lot of different games because you can have your favorites. And I think baseball is starting to kind of cultivate that kind of culture. And that can only be good for baseball. Here's my problem with it um, is that it is unadulterated cultural appropriation yes imitation is a serious form of flattery but this is also like you go back and look at like these groups in the 50s and 60s when the white guys would listen to the black radio station and hear the records that are hits and then transcribe it run across town get some white guys to record it and make a bunch of money like that's what this is that's all it is so he's 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 imitating cool he's flattering cool but you didn't make this up like you don't have your own celebration jock peterson all that said, I'm in on the second one. You know why? It's because he did it to the St. Louis freaking Cardinals, like the <laughs> most annoying, sanctimonious keepers of the code of baseball's unwritten rules. And it drives them crazy to have somebody do that to them. I'm surprised the next pitch to Jock Peterson didn't go in his ear, but anyone who makes the St. Louis Cardinals like eat crow and choke on their own sanctimony, I'm in on it. Are, Morgan, are you saying that Jock Peterson is the Pat Boone of baseball? <laughs> yeah, he's like the uh, the Osmonds, right? right, right. <laughs> he's Osmonds, and Tatis Jr. is is uh, the Jackson Five. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Uh, Tatis Jr. is 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 living single, and and Jock Peterson is friends. There it goes. <laughs> 
and the younger viewers are like, what are the, they're 90 sitcoms, guys. <laughs> Hit the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, it's been fun. My favorite 40-ish minutes of the week. Hey, Corey Erdman, when you're not here, tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, as, as Morgan said, you can find me on a lot of boxing broadcasts. <laughs> and uh, to find out when those are, you can follow me uh, on Twitter at Corey underscore Erdman. Uh, and every Monday, uh, I write the lead column on BoxingScene.com, CBS's uh, boxing portal. So you can catch my boxing thoughts on there as well. Perfect. And Megan McPeak, when you're not here, where can the people find you? Uh, either in the weight room or on Twitter at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H because it's the right way to do it. In the weight room. Wait, this is new. Last time we talked, you were like <laughs> switching your fitness program around. What's happening in the weight room these days, Megan? I'm, I'm, I'm getting gains is what's happening, Morgan. You're yeah, going to come back looking be, like... I'm trying to be like you. You know, <laughs> as I said, I'm, I'm built like a, a, a mid eighties pro wrestler right now. My physique is like half Arn Anderson, half Dino Bravo, but uh, <laughs> it's functional as, as uh, the enforcer says. And as for me, I'm at Morgan P Campbell on Twitter at Morgan P Campbell on Instagram. I'm too old for Twitter. Uh, sorry, sorry. At Morgan P Campbell on Twitter at Morgan P Campbell on Instagram. I'm too old for TikTok. Uh, too young for Triller. Uh, and you guys can find me back here every week. If you like what you heard, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment. If you dislike what you heard, hit dislike, uh, leave a nasty comment. We don't care. We're just trying to feed the algorithm. All engagements matter. Uh, it's been 40 minutes of fun. Uh, hopefully this will hit the internet before too long. And we will see you guys next week here on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell.